was thinking how to frame this a number of times because I don't want to give you a sort of traditional history lecture. Uh, but I do want to touch on a theme that I think um, gets lost in the discussion a lot, which is that the Middle East really is, it's a global conflict and it is of signal importance because it is blocking us from doing the things we have to do to save our planet. Um, it's the center of one of the centers of fossil fuel production. Um, it's a uh, source that absorbs enormous amounts of money in terms of uh, military equipment and uh, has perpetuated the military industrial complex. Um, it's on the front lines of climate change, um, the humanitarian disasters throughout the regions of the worst in the world. And all of these together really uh, are, you know, tell us, you know, where this planet is going, where we're going. And so we have to, uh, I strongly believe, combine these struggles um, for climate justice and a, a same policy in terms of the environment uh, with activism to prevent war, to end this war cycle, because we are in this totally insane, self-destructive uh, cycle of conflict and self-destruction, global destruction, uh, of course, with uh, the peoples of the Middle East and North Africa um, on the front end of, of what is happening. So, um, so as I said, it's, it's not going to be a a more traditional um, history of background. So I begin with the present, and of course, if you study the Middle East, you're working in the Middle East, something's changing, not just every day, but every minute, and uh, with the erratic, crazy, irresponsible criminal who's in uh, government uh, south of the border, um, this goes on you know, minute by minute. Um, and the latest is this quote unquote deal of the century, which is brokered by a childhood friend of Netanyahu, who happens to be the son-in-law of the president, um, and reads, uh, you know, I took a brief look at the text, it's 108 pages, uh, scarcely sufficient, um, and the highlights are basically the Palestinians surrender everything, completely unilateral, um, but the brochure itself, and even, even the poster looks like uh, a real estate brochure, um, with the idea, I mean, I think implicit in a lot of these things, that the Palestinians are going to be uh, induced to trade away what remaining rights they have, you know, for a good deal. Um, and if you see, it's it's so, sort of hard to see on some of these. Um, I'm not going to linger. There's these sort of uh, entertainment centers, development centers planned in this totally bizarre program that has uh, no element of justice, no element of fairness, and no realism. Um, in terms of uh, what the region and peoples will accept. And of course, in historical perspective, as bad as 47 uh, UN peace plan was, this is just absurd. Um, with border walls being more formalized, that's envisioned in this project, with autonomy only being given once the Palestinians get rid of the governments that the West doesn't like, namely Hamas. So all of this is contingent, all of these wonderful uh, goods that uh, promised to be delivered. Um, and so this um, came out by tweet and of course by um, announcement uh, just a few hours ago. Um, and it follows, I don't want to offend anybody, but it follows these equally ridiculous, offensive, racist uh, type of tweets, uh, crimes against, threatening crimes against humanity uh, in 50, by targeting 52 sites um, in Iran. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, what does one say? Retweeting uh, this picture, which paints all Muslims, of course, as enemies of the world and enemies, personal enemies of Donald Trump, and whether it's Islamophobic or anti-Semitic, or you know, all these things rolled into one. Plus, of course, assuming that every Iranian is an enemy of uh, of the world and of the United States, it's it's you know, par for the course of what we've been getting. So we've reached a new level of um, tragic, and it's not comic, tragic absurdity, uh, horrific absurdity, but it had its sort of more close beginnings um, on uh, September 11, 2001. Um, and um, it was there that 2,977 people, including uh, the hijackers themselves, were killed in, this, um, in these attacks. Uh, which should be regarded as crimes against humanity. They were not war crimes, they were not committed 
by a government as such, um, and there was perfectly legitimate uh, ways to deal with this in terms of an international policing uh, operation, um, which the whole world was on board with. I mean, for, it, was, it was amazing. In 2001, uh, the Russians were stepping forward and saying, oh, use armed air base here, and do this here, and, you know, and the U.S. just completely took advantage of it, um, and of course, launched not one, but two wars, and even at that time, the Iran war was in the offing. So Iran was in um, that projection. And so what's resulted from the deaths, the tragic deaths of 2,000, a little less than 3,000 people in New York, Pennsylvania, and Washington, has metastasized into a regional um, and if not global war um, with you know, different degrees of intensity of fighting um, from civil war in Libya, completely divided, um, to one of the greatest humanitarian uh, disasters on the planet with mass starvation going on in Yemen. Of course, enormous displacement, continuing bombing and killing of civilians um, in Syria, uh, destabilization in Iran, Iraq, um, and, uh, and of course, Afghanistan, which is basically on the throes of becoming another you know, uh, Taliban uh, 2.0, um, a new Taliban state. Um, and in the process of uh, Brown's University's Cost of War Project, um, which is really admirable, and I suggest that you all find that link if you haven't, um, they've been keeping tabs. They've tried to compile uh, both the legal aspects, they have an environmental, um, the environmental impacts of these wars, um, bombings, the mining, uh, mass mining, millions of mines are left in the region so that every day uh, poor farmers have uh, a leg blown off. Uh, because uh, there's been no time uh, to demine and more mines are laid. So they've, uh, they've, uh, they've done, compiled these costs, these numbers, these statistics. And I'm not, you know, I shouldn't start with it, but I will start with, you know, what uh, the U.S. thought it was going to get for, um, you know, in return or to avenge the lives of 3,000 people. What, what happened so far is um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,800 uh, soldiers, U.S. soldiers have been killed. Um, and according to the Department of Defense, 52,000 uh, wounded in action. But in effect, there are almost a million soldiers who are returning from the battlefield with very <coughs> traumatic injuries, uh, either psychological or physical, uh, because the rate of survival is actually much higher in Vietnam. Um, in earlier wars, World War II, people wouldn't have survived with body armor. Now people are surviving, but without arms and legs and parts of faces and uh, all sorts of other horrific, horrific um, impacts. So that's, of course, only one part. Um, and the civilian part is much higher. Um, even the military doesn't include uh, what happens on the other side. How many tens of thousands of combatants on the other side have been killed? Um, their estimate ranges um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 114,000. Um, it's here, sorry. So it's 114,000 opposition fighters, uh, journalists, humanitarian workers, but of course, uh, uh, the largest is portion is civilians. Um, so many times the amount of combatants uh, who are dead. And of course, this is just uh, the tip of the iceberg because um, when uh, in the early stages of the Iraq war, the Lancet uh, did estimates of civilian casualties. They also included people who died because of the war, because they couldn't get to a hospital, um, because uh, things, you know, they, they didn't have supplies. Um, so there was the excess deaths was much, much higher. And of course, this uh, only includes Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq at a certain level, and not the uh, extended conflicts um, that have engulfed um, the whole region um, that are really the knock-on effect of these wars and the continuing of you know, car bombs and explosions in places like Iraq um, and elsewhere. Um, in addition to that, the number of war refugees is just uh, astronomical. Um, some people have returned home, some people are permanently displaced, some people have been displaced multiple times. Uh, Palestinians for one group, 
were refugees in Syria, have been displaced, they were refugees in Iraq, were displaced again. So uh, these numbers represent, um, in the most starkest terms, the experience of what it means uh, to be uh, in flight from a war zone, to pick up with you know, very minimal uh, effects in your children and lose people a long way, um, and then to be resettled in these huge camps that are larger than King Sinai, these refugee camps in the Middle East, um, in Jordan, in Lebanon, um, and in Turkey. And the dynamics of these uh, refugees within uh, these new countries, which adds another political dimension to it um, that um, we, can, we can talk about, and perhaps we have people here who talk about it better than I can. So, um, you know, we can date this, I think I skipped one here, let me back to this. I think we can date this period of endless war um, to the very end of the Cold War. Um, and somewhere along the line in the 1990s, uh, Herbert Walker Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, and uh, Maggie Thatcher promised us a peace dividend um, after 89 uh, when the Cold War ended. Of course, that never materialized. And um, much of the effects, much of the tensions in the region um, can be dated back to uh, the Cold War itself, with an enormous buildup of weapons in the region, um, efforts by the United States especially uh, to keep the most dictatorial powers, uh, governments in there to facilitate the extraction of resources and their strategic interests, um, including uh, relationships increasingly, and not immediately in the early part of the Cold War, uh, this strategic relationship with Israel, which would then become um, one of the region's only nuclear powers, although constantly disavowing that. Um, and so you can see, you know, some of these countries were part of the, um, what we call the Middle East. Turkey, for example, is, is in the UN's terminology, is not technically part of the Middle East, uh, but it's, you know, we commonly refer to it as such, and it was part of NATO. Uh, the Iran was supposedly, according to uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, famous last words, a rock of civility in a roiling sea, um, so that was on the eve of the revolution. So I would say, in many respects, the Cold War shift, it didn't end, you know, sort of shifted after 79, unlike 89. Um, and um, it was intricately, um, uh, involved in the um, pressure on the Soviet Union, which finally led to its, its sort of implosion. Um, and um, it started, however, really you know, in, in two countries that were side by side, Afghanistan and Iran. But I think it was Iran that pushed uh, the whole thing forward very quickly. So in Iran, uh, the US had um, you know, one of its most important allies, huge consumer of European and North American weapons of all sorts. Um, of course, a massive supplier of, of oil, has a large oil reserves um, that had been exploited by the British. Um, and of course, long history of the British in their Russia to, uh, to some extent, but not so much after World War I. Um, and then uh, the US carrying the mantle in the post uh, World War II period. Um, and uh, there, the uh, U.S. has been very much complicit um, in the atrocities of the regime. Um, this is a photograph, it's a wonderful photograph from the revolution in 79, uh, which triggered, uh, I think, a snowball effect of, of a superpower intervention, particularly in the United States. Um, but the U.S. had these unsavory connections of overthrowing uh, democracies in the region, going back to the 50s again, of the Cold War with the notion that any kind of democratic movement was a potential ally you know, in the Soviet bloc and misreading nationalism uh, for communism. So um, the Iranian Revolution, the success of the Iranian Revolution, uh, soon turned the US eyes to a neighboring country, a uh, small country, Afghanistan, uh, landlocked, one of the poorest countries in the world at the time, uh, and still even more so. Um, and a sandwich between um, Soviet Union, Soviet-controlled uh, areas, um, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan in the north, has a small little part that touches China, um, and in the east, Pakistan, and on the west, of course, uh, shares a long border uh, with Iran. So the focus of this late Cold War attention 
came on to uh, Afghanistan. Um, and it was in Afghanistan, it was one of these rare cases where um, the Cold War actually had produced somewhat benefits. It was odd. Uh, so the Soviets would come in and they'd educate 50 Afghan people and bring them to Moscow and, and then or Leningrad and they'd get good education. And the other ones would go to City Albany and it was back and forth. The, the Soviets would build a road, the Americans would build a hospital. And it was a sort of friendly rivalry because what did Afghanistan have? It's just sort of this buffer and they could sort of agree to disagree. But all of that changed in 79. So all of that changed. The US had lost uh, Iran. Uh, and that was considered a major blow to US uh, foreign policy. And uh, although they didn't lose Iran to the Soviet Union, they still you know, were going to make the Soviet Union pay for uh, their losses. Um, and so immediately what happens, and I happened to be in Afghanistan at the time, and I saw this build up, was um, they immediately started funding a resistance. Um, they started uh, supporting a resistance against um, a Soviet-backed government that had come into power the year before. Um, and that government, was, there were a couple of communist parties, one succeeded the other. Uh, the first one was not very uh, organized and made a lot of mistakes and provoked reaction, especially among uh, the landed elites who feared that the peasants would get land, there would be you know, land uh, sharing, there would be you know, socialist transformation of land and, and all sorts of other things. And the US was right there, the CIA was right there to encourage that. Um, and eventually a lot of those elites, those large land owning elites end up in Pakistan and through Pakistan, with the aid of the Pakistani government, uh, the US, and Saudi Arabia, those being the two biggest funders, uh, these groups would be armed um, in order to be a resistance force. They were going to give uh, the Soviet Union its Vietnam. And I have uh, Rambo III set there uh, with all of its bravado, absurdity, and in, you know, just. Uh, insensitivity, you know, and cut off this from the world, but um, it gives you an idea of how the war was portrayed to the American people. Um, and, um, and so these were the freedom fighters, these Mujahideen were freedom fighters, um, um, and they, they had very little ideology, they had, uh, you know, they had uh, religious leaders who gave their blessing to uh, many of them, but many of them were just, you know, they had lost their land, um, and they had lost their rights, and now they were being encouraged to form uh, these groups. They were very poorly united, uh, often fought among each other, um, and created different alliances. Um, but they got a whole bunch of equipment, and Afghanistan did, became the site of an internationalist cause, uh, which drew in uh, Muslim fighters from other regions, including a person whose name is more familiar to you, Osama bin Laden. Uh, so he gets his start really in Afghanistan. Um, and this long protracted war in Afghanistan, uh, second now only to what happened in Iraq, um, <laughs> became this training ground uh, for a whole generation of internationalists, I call them, internationalist Islamists, uh, who were, oh, you know, came from all over North Africa, some ended up coming later, really from China, but not that many, Egypt, um, and one can go on. Um, but they also compiled this huge database. I mean, they had this database online with you know, every possible mode of, of asymmetrical warfare um, that was possible, that they learned by cutting their teeth against the Soviet army. Um, um, and so in this long war uh, that would continue for a decade, um, it was a pure situation, there was no real victors, uh, but the Soviets eventually withdrew um, defeated both because um, the war was not ending um, and there was an unlimited pipeline of funds coming in from Saudi Arabia um, and uh, the United States. In the meantime, of course, Afghan society was turned upside down. Uh, millions of people were turned into refugees, ended up in Iran, in Iran and uh, Pakistan largely, um, and displaced all around the world. Um, and in those uh, very trying, desperate situations, were again uh, brought into given aid, but with a price through the Saudis um, and other right-wing uh, conservative 
uh, Islamist groups and who would, and inculcated these young men primarily um, into these ideologies um, and formed several generations of, of fighters. So, um, so this is you know Afghanistan, um, and it played a significant role in bankrupting um, and both ideologically and uh, economically the Soviet Union. So, you know, here we are, the withdrawal in Afghanistan, you know, all eyes are fixed on the Berlin Wall, but really there's a withdrawal going on in Afghanistan, and for the next decade, Afghanistan's going to descend into civil war. Horrible civil war, with all those different Mujahideen groups fighting among each other, committing atrocities, uh, the likes of which, uh, in some cases, were much worse than what the Soviets had carried out. They went after anyone they saw who might have collaborated, um, and um, you know, it was just a free-for-all of plunder, rapine, um, and rape. Um, friends of mine who tried to do, uh, and had done, attempted to do oral histories of period are just horrified at the things uh, that they learned. So the, the, the country was left in total chaos, and the US turned its back on, on the country and let it descend into chaos, and these groups uh, took uh, lodged in there. Um, and in the meantime, of course, the U.S. was celebrating its great victory against the Soviet Union um, at, this, at this moment. Who cares about uh, the number of people who died from the many hot wars of the Cold War? Um, and they launched on this program immediately to make the world safe for uh, neoliberal capitalism. Um, and so you have this uh, late uh, 20th century conjuncture uh, where you have uh, leading the charge, of course, Reagan and Thatcher and then their successors, where you have privatization, and you had this euphoria in uh, U.S. circles, especially they were the year of Hitler. You know, they were the sole superpower left on the block, um, and they could do anything, and they could redesign the world with such a, a, a level of arrogance. And you know, what's amazing is these people are still in government. These people from the 80s and 90s onward are still in the U.S. government and they are still directing U.S. policy. It's, it's shocking. Um, along with this, the idea was to get rid of the liability of having live soldiers. Because live soldiers, you know, they're citizens, some of them. And when they die, uh, they get upset and maybe they'll vote you out of office. So the idea was to move into more privatization of the military. Um, and the U.S. military is highly privatized, not just support uh, structures, but you know, uh, manpower, mercenaries replacing uh, regular soldiers uh, left and right, as well as to go into uh, these new technologies like drone warfare, uh, where you press a button and you assassinate uh, a supposed target along with their family and their extended family and a wedding party and, and everybody else. Um, and uh, you pay no price. You have actually, we have a station right here in Syracuse, um, outside of Syracuse, where uh, those drone strikes are launched into the Middle East, you know, into Pakistan. So, and at that moment, you get this regrouping of the neocons um, in this new um, uh, uh, institute. Um, uh, it's the Institute for the New Century, and some of the people you can see here, they're sort of split on the radio team. Uh, Bolton was team, uh, sorry, team Trump for a while, uh, Kagan and Crystal have now gone off and sort of been Trump uh, critics, you know, for whatever reason, they can be sort of cynical about it. Maybe he's not uh, doing what they want quickly enough, and certainly uh, there was rumor that in order to appease John Bolton, uh, that was one of the reasons that Trump went ahead uh, with this illegal assassination of a uh, foreign um, uh, military leader, uh, Qasem Soleimani. So this was their manifesto in this, you know, heyday of you know the end of the Cold War. Hurrah, hurrah! Um, they were out to rebuild America's defenses. Just when we were being told there was going to be uh, a peace dividend, they were going to take all that money and build up the military even greater than. It had been. Um, and their theory was, this is the way they colloquially put it, America is a boxer between the backs. You know, watch out for phase two, for the next round. So here are the principles that they adhere to. That U.S. would be a global, single global hegemon. It would be the world's policeman. And they had to have the ability to wage multi-front wars. 
Now this is in 2000, right? So this is before 9-11. Um, this late 1990s, 2000, they're formulating this. Defensive and an offensive continuum, there's no difference. And uh, those of you might remember George, uh, son of George Herbert Walker Bush, George W., uh, you know, said this preemptive war. You know, he had this new doctrine, which has now become, you know, the uh, principle for drone attacks, assassinations, um, imminence meaning, you know, from now to eternity, um, and all of that. So you have defensive, offensive continuum, um, regime change, and preemptive war. You have a pivot. They were supposed to move away from the Middle East toward East Asia, um, and really hunker down and concentrate on what they call the new international commons of space and cyberspace. And we see Trump uh, going in that direction, especially with this space force. Um, and a synergy of war and markets. Now, this is, of course, something that Dwight Eisenhower warned uh, everybody against in 1961, the military industrial complex. And this is what they want. This is how they're going to keep things going. Uh, so they want to expand the budget, get everyone on the military gravy train. And interestingly enough, in the United States, a lot of those uh, industries that produce weapons are actually one of the last industries that are unionized, and they pay high wages. So you have this perverse incentive all the way down, uh, you know, the sociological ladder uh, from the CEOs to the workers, um, and maintain the voluntary forces while continuing privatization of the military to to cut off the risk of you know of citizens protesting, you know, and maybe you know running off to Canada so that they don't uh, serve in the war. Although they did, and the Canadians didn't uh, accept them during the uh, the wars of the 2000s. So what would then happen, you know, between the late 70s, 80s, and today, is this complete expansion of US bases all around the world, but also especially uh, in the region. Um, with campaign after campaign, campaigns you hear about, campaigns you hear about less about, unless you're fam very familiar with the region, or you thought forbid you're in the region, and they're happening. Um, and this is Andrew Vasevich's uh, map that he's drawn up to, I think, about 2015. Um, the extent of US operations, the numbers uh, going on and on. And of course, they have their coalition partners. Sometimes Canada's willing, sometimes it's unwilling. Uh, thankfully, uh, for Canadians, they didn't sign on to 2003 uh, to the Iraq War. Uh, but there still were just Canadian soldiers who were pulled out of Iraq recently. Um, and so when 9-11 happened, uh, they immediately, as I said, there was this immense goodwill. Uh, the US could have formed a coalition. Uh, police had an international trial, tried uh, whoever was proved to have been guilty or masterminding uh, the plot, um, and let it stay there. But instead, it chose to invade Afghanistan because Afghanistan refused to turn over the purported head of the plot, Osama bin Laden. Um, and they did this, they thought they could do this on the cheap, with air power, just bombing uh, all the Taliban forces. They slaughtered many of them with these bombing raids and, of course, killed a lot of civilians. They precipitated mass flights, so a lot of people died. Um, Afghanistan was also going through a famine at the time, and so they prevented humanitarian aid coming into the country because they had to do this. And they turned over basically the underground operations to the last standing anti-Taliban force, um, which is not a good idea because these guys have their own agendas and revenge. And so there, there ensued uh, the chaos, uh, which would continue uh, because of this lackadaisical approach and this idea that technology over everything. Um, and they very quickly decided the next target, which was going to be Iraq. So in 2003, after trumping up with concocting with Tony Blair in Britain um, and in the United States with seemingly reputable military authorities like Colin Powell, uh, they trumped up charges against Iraq that it had weapons of mass destruction, was evading international inspections, um, and was an imminent threat. Um, and therefore, um, in order to take uh, the regime out, they could invade the country. Um, and so uh, that it was the beginning, again, of the end. And the idea
idea being that you can invade a country, I think the size of California, uh, with very few troops, with no plan, because they rejected any planning, because the, the, these are, these are post-reality thinkers. Um, so they believe that um, they don't belong to the reality world. So they think that you have a free market, it operates just like it did so wonderfully in post-Soviet Union, and everything falls into place. You know? Everything will take care of itself. The market will take care of everything. And so uh, immediately chaos ensued because they had no plan for transition of power, for the occupation, for dealing with basic human needs, for keeping the country running, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so in addition to the military disaster, the whole thing was the, uh, the aftermath and the calamity. And here I just want to say something uh, quickly about oil, because I think the, the way people think about these wars, it's sort of like, yeah, it's the oil stupid. Yeah, that's why we, we left Afghanistan and go to uh, Iraq. It's not quite that simple. Um, it has to do with controlling price and access. Because uh, the US actually at this point under Obama uh, now is producing more natural gas, thanks to the horrible production fracking, uh, than Russia is. And it's completely self-sufficient, doesn't need uh, Canadian tar sands, um, and produces enough oil. But if you control the Middle East, you control China, you control Japan, you control Europe. Uh, so these, so this is, and you get a permanent base there. Right? The other thing it does, of course, um, you know, and this, this is the other sad part of the story, is that chaos also creates havoc in oil markets, which pumps up the price of oil, which benefits especially countries like Canada, which oil is so expensive to produce that you need that extra buck to even, you know, eke out a little bit of profit. Um, so it's a very, very perverse situation, the impact of instability on uh, these oil markets. Uh, and to, so it's a win-win situation. Make a mess, it's still a win uh, for someone. Um, and you can see that um, in this, I don't have a longer term, but the tar sands oils only really became um, profitable with these wars after 2003, because it has to be like somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to $70 a barrel keep it up there, and it was nowhere near there before 2003, um, to make a profit. And so you can see that the, the most expensive oil on the planet to mine to, uh, is the tar sands. Um, and so in order to keep that margin of profit going, uh, you need something to destabilize prices. So Canadians have been this beneficiary, were this beneficiary of this as well. Uh, the other thing that keeps this whole thing going um, is, of course, the military-industrial complex. Um, and, uh, sorry, this, this is not the one I wanted. Sorry, forgive me. Um, so is the military-industrial complex. I'll just go there quickly. Um, and you can see here uh, who purchases weapons. Uh, the purple is the Middle East. Uh, so they purchase some more chaos, Use your money, use your oil money uh, to purchase. And opium production, which was supposed to be eradicated, of course, just surged uh, during this time period. Largely because of the corrupt government that was making a lot of money from the Afghan government. Um, and I can think of no more graphic illustration of you know, what's happened is just following, if you go on the travel advisories, the British travel advisories, and you look at the maps for Afghanistan, and here's the map from 2011, where uh, the yellow is advised against all but essential travel uh, for foreign visitors, right? And the rest is like, absolutely not. Do not go to these regions because they are full-fledged uh, insurgency and warfare. So that's uh, 2011, and you see the most recent map, which is old. And uh, the travel advisory even advises against going to the capital. Um, the situation is so precarious. Um, and the Trump administration, perhaps in the saner things at the time, is actually uh, has negotiations going on. Um, so, but of course, throughout this whole thing, um, civilians have taken a heavy toll and they've increased. Um, and it's pro government forces and anti government forces. Mm -hmm. The wars have spread 
throughout the region and fostered new extremist groups. And I think you can think about it in terms of what happened when the US bombed uh, Cambodia. Uh, we ended up with very extremist groups and a genocide. And I think that's what happens when you create these horrific, desperate situations. Um, and you know, people see you know, what, what they have uh, before them and how they can possibly fight it. Um, and these huge uh, camps uh, of refugees, these particularly uh, Syrians, but in the early 2000s, it would have been Iraqis uh, who were there, and the Iraqis also went uh, to Syria. So, as I said, there's this uh, synergy, this horrific synergy between arms suppliers, um, control of the region that produces about 50% of uh, the world's oil uh, sources, which are also 50%, those, those very industries are producing a huge percentage of greenhouse gases, you know, so preserving them and, and funding them is also destroying the planet. Um, and there's enough money to go around. So the Canadians, although Harper uh, was criticized for this deal he reached with the Saudis and they denounced Saudi human rights records, that deal is going to work, has worked, um, to uh, provide the Saudis with the military exports. Um, and the Middle East and Saudi Arabia in particular is the largest recipient of those exports um, um, and Turkey being also up there. Uh, which is something to note for people who are concerned about Turkey's human rights record. And all of this is going on, and I wrap up here, uh, when these absurd tweets, these insulting tweets, um, these threats to commit uh, crimes against humanity, the transformation of the Palestine issue into a real estate brochure for Florida and Mar-a-Lago um, are all going on while the planet burns. Um, and the Bulletin of Atomic uh, Scientists have moved the doomsday clock on January 23rd uh, to be less than two minutes before midnight uh, because of the escalation of tensions around uh, nuclear agreements. The U.S. has not only withdrawn from the JCPOK, I think, yeah, with Iran, but they also withdrew from the intermediate. Uh, range ballistic missile with Russia. So it's opening up a new door for a nuclear arms race. Uh, the number of nuclear weapons had gone down in the 1990s. And then of course, we're in full-fledged climate crisis. It's no longer on the horizon, it's here, it's arrived. Um, and some regions are up in flames, others are underwater, and this is only gonna get worse. And the third thing that the, uh, the atomic scientists, and you can see here Jerry Brown, California, uh, Mary Douglas, former president of Ireland, um, who are part of this uh, group of people who are their advisory board. The other thing they point out is we're also facing disruptive technologies, um, which are compounding all these problems uh, because they're putting out alternative realities, alternative truths, uh, manipulating elections on a very large scale um, and manipulating uh, basic information that people read as they're in their little silos uh, on the internet. So these things com uh, combined is the sort of, um, uh, uh, um, it, it accelerates a compounded effect uh, with the technologies. Uh, so we would say, just to wrap up, uh, that the Middle East wars are very much everyone's they're the whole planet's wars. And uh, the time has really come to an end where we can sort of compartmentalize and say, oh, we're marching against war, and then we're marching for a livable planet. The two are completely intertwined, completely intertwined. And until we break this cycle of endless war, uh, and we break the link of our governments um, that have basically hardwired uh, our economies into uh, regressive, uh, you know, uh, harmful, toxic uh, uh, industries like fossil fuel, but also uh, military uh, weaponry. Until we break that nexus, um, it's very difficult to deal with the larger problems and to create the kind of trust that's necessary uh, to have a cooperation on this very critical front of, uh, of the climate and the environment. So I leave it there.
but it doesn't mean that we kind of live in a period where the U.S. hegemony or as a global hegemony is not contested. I guess U.S. In, uh, uh, Iraqi invasion is also a proof of that because what they were imagining, you know, like that would happen in Iraq did not happen, right? After the invasion, the resistance that took place, which kind of combined both Sunni and Shia uh, uh, sectors of the society, and the US administration's strategies to divide the resistance, creating a system uh, in Iraq, which is based on sectarian, actually, division of power, uh, also created a sectarian, uh, let's say, politics. And it's uh, being, you know, like prevalent not only at the state level, but also somehow poisoning the people's movements in the region. So this is an important point, because when ISIS is being discussed, you know, like in the Western sphere, we, we, we often, you know, like witness ISIS as a, you know, like Islamic fundamentalist, uh, jihadist terrorist group, as if it came out of nowhere. But when you think of the uh, political makeup, administrative to make up of the post-Iraqi invasion, you can see what kind of sectarian divides actually uh, organization like ISIS uh, fed on and spread from Iraq to Syria. That's, I think, important <coughs> point. Another important point, I think, since the Iraqi invasion, we have seen uh, certain regional powers right, growing. One of them is actually Saudi Arabia. The, uh, I'm not going to present numbers with the military deals and everything, but I think Dr. <coughs> Salzman explained it well. It's not only, uh, it is not that US needs the oil reserves or resources from Saudi Arabia, but the whole political economic makeup, importance of petrodollars, you know, their kind of uh, presence in European banks, they are being channeled back into the developing countries. So the, all the price uh, balance that is uh, maintained at global level has something to do with the US-Saudi alliance, which has been, uh, I think, growing since the 70s. And with the uh, invasion of Iraq, actually, they uh, moved to another level. With this election of Trump, we see even, you know, like more over, yeah, obvious, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, like statements, the latest visit. Uh, and so the second power maybe that we should be talking about is Iran. Uh, you know, after the 1970, uh, 1979 revolution, uh, we saw like an Iraq-Iran war that lasted for uh, more than eight years. And back then the United States supported Iraq against Iran, which also kind of created sectarian dynamics in the uh, region. But after the war ended, and I think in the uh, in the Iraqi political space after the invasion, Iran found you know like a fertile ground to actually increase its uh, ge geopolitical you know like interests. So it is uh, when Saudi Arabia is you know like growing in terms of you know like military investments or petrochemicals, you know uh, in many sectors, Iran also found you know like a value to increase its uh, influence beyond its uh, territory, uh, up until the maybe sanctions that were imposed, which kind of reversed the GDP growth of Iran in the region. And of course, the, uh, uh, again, Dr. Salzman mentioned, but uh, we cannot just talk about Middle East without talking about Israel, while all the countries are kind of in the developing or underdeveloped uh, bracket of the uh, developmental scale of the world, Israel is the only country that is put in the developed state. So the immense channeling of military and economic aid, the uh, uh, deals, you know, like struck there, uh, makes Israel, you know, as a kind of permanent, uh, ally of the US and uh, Western imperialist powers in the region. So uh, this kind of regional, uh, Egypt on the other hand, we can say, especially after the deal that made with, in 1978 with the Israel, like a neutralized military power. So the old military aid channel to Egypt was kind of, not to make it an aggressive regional ally, but a neutral ally that won't challenge US hegemony in the region. So uh, uh, that's why, you know, like looking at the Middle East requires a nuanced understanding. We do not have a club of countries challenging imperialism or countries with, you know, like uh, very similar geopolitical uh, aspirations, but we see also a war of hegemony at the sub-imperial re level, which is reproduced, you know, like by the states and their inter 
uh, interventions. Um, so maybe this is kind of the uh, negative side, ruling classes, bureaucrats, dictators, whatever. But this has been challenged severely when the Arab uprising happened uh, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2011, which started in Tunisia and then moved on to Egypt, and then we saw in Syria, uh, Bahrain, Yemen. You know, like in kind of both North Africa and the Middle East, we have seen a wave of protest, which. Uh, threatened, of course, status quo in the region, severely. When we think of Tunisia, that kind of transition compared to other places was more successful, but in Egypt we have seen a uh, struggle that lasted for two, three years, and then we saw a military coup happening, which is financed by Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates in the first place. So the forces of actually counter people, counter revolution, are also situated in the Middle East. And the big powers, great military powers, adjusted, adapted their foreign, foreign policy immediately uh, about what's going on there. And the Syrian I think, uprising was the one uh, that created the um, vacuum where we have seen a proxy war, right? On one hand, uh, the uprising that started with the student march oppressed immediately. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed since then. Uh, like um, the Human Rights Watch says that it is almost 400,000, right? Millions have been displaced. But at the same time, regional and big imperial powers uh, intervened immediately, and Turkey is one of them, actually. One of the political crises that the AKP government, uh, uh, Justice and Development Government, which has been in power in Turkey since 2002, went through was actually transfer of weapons through some trucks, uh, through the from Turkish border to Syria, supporting some of the factions there. Not, of course, uh, in, in the interest of the people, but actually uh, to creating a political administrative space where Turkish ruling class can have uh, amicable relationships with, right? So we have seen Syrian civil war turning into actually a war, a, a proxy war between the regional powers and the big powers. And uh, uh, in, in Libya, on the other hand, uh, maybe some of you can, of course, contribute. I know that here we have a diverse group of people coming from different countries in the Middle East, so you can contribute to the debate based on your own experiences. In Libya, what we have seen is NATO intervention, and uh, recently, like Turkey passed a um, decision in the parliament supporting Turkish troops, you know, like staging, being staged in Libya. So what they care about is, of course, not the Libyan people. What they care about is in the uh, eastern Mediterranean, you know, hydrocarbon reserves. What kind of uh, deals can be struck? What kind of resources can be extracted? Similarly, with Greece and Cyprus, you know, there is this tension now, which is which in which U.S. is also to a certain extent involved. So Turkish state and ruling class try to use the you know like the geopolitics to its end to the interest. Uh, uh, that they can, you know, uh, extract from this uh, conflict, and uh, uh, from here, uh, the, uh, so the withdrawal of this people's uprising, uh, increasing civil wars, proxy wars, increasing sectarianism, which uh, mostly uh, started with the Iraqi invasion and its, you know, repercussion and uh, uh, expansion, unfortunately, suffocated, of course, people's movement. The region, which is which is which is really sad because uh, like the, the for decades certain dictators had not been contested and we have seen their uh, uh, like over being overthrown by people. Now what we are seeing is actually a second wave, which is again inspiring. Uh, I, again, I know people that are from Algeria, Sudan, you know, like other parts. We have seen a wave of protest, Lebanon, uh, over the last year uh, happening in the region. In uh, Sudan, you know, uh, again a dictator was toppled down. Now the fight is still going on. The government with the Transitional Military Council and the civilians, who is going to govern the country? In Algeria, uh, which Africa, you know, like left, but the legacy, you know, like what kind of system is going to happen, it is still a matter of debate and people are on the street. So these are all revolutionary upheavals, you know, which, whose trajectories we do not know. In Lebanon, uh, although, you know, like sectarianism seems to have inflicted the region for a long time, in Lebanon what we see is a cross-sectarian solidarity, 
against the uh, administration there, which is kind of similar to the one that the U.S. instigated in Iraq. Uh, again, administrative uh, division of bureaucracy and political offices across sects, and most of them are businessmen, privileged people, uh, de delivering the resources to a minority, uh, leaving the rest of the country waterless, without electricity, without infrastructure, without hygiene, without sanitation. Now it is being const contested from below, I think. And in Ura, the whole, you know, like catastrophe, one million people were killed, millions were displaced. Again, infrastructure is bad. People go to hospitals, die on the hospital floors. People do not have electricity. They get two hours of electricity during uh, the day. And most of the, the bureaucrats and politicians, they run genera the generator companies and they, you know, sell them to people. It is being contested. And, uh, it was very interesting that I read, you know, like one of the uh, one of the participants, you know, like who um, was in the uprising. It is still going on today. Four million people uh, on the streets in Iraq, actually, uh, and so far, uh, almost, you know, more than 600 people have been killed in Iraq, and they are not going back. They say, uh, one of the protesters say that all the people who died have candles in Tahrir Square, a square. In the Iraq, the holy books, yeah. So people came, even if they are not one of their families, they do say a prayer, they read Quran for them. You can see Christians, Muslims from all sects, Yazidis, Sabians. In London, even Iraqi Jews actually joined the demonstrations in solidarity. So the sectarian divide is being challenged from below. What US aggression is doing actually, making it very difficult for, for, for people to sustain this uh, popular unity, I believe. Because once the war on, you know, like Iran is the question, for the Iranian regime, it is the easiest thing actually to uh, accuse, you know, like US imperialism and get rid of it from, uh, of its own sins of, you know, like oppressive agenda. It makes it difficult for Iranian people to sustain, uh, to sustain their resistance. And we know uh, almost 1,500 people were killed in Iran recently. They are on the streets saying to no to their own rulers and saying no to America. Of course there are fractions, but I think it is an important voice that we should be hearing uh, from here and we are extending our solidarity and we, have, we are discussing um, uh, Islamophobia and anti-imperialism. So lastly, maybe the contribution to this debate uh, can be from, from the Turkish experience. Although I have been giving you some pieces and uh, some pieces of the picture, you know, like the Turkish involvement, uh, it is, I think it has a teaching lesson, you know, like the whole trajectory of the Turkish political power over the last 16 years. Uh, when AKP, the ruling party, came to power, it came to power in a place where all the ex-military bureaucratic governance and, you know, their uh, long-lasting, you know, since the foundation of Turkish Republic in 1923 and its official ideology, Kemalism, you know, that has been, has been in power. And there was a big crisis in 2001, and when AKP came, came to power, they represented the interest of the Anatolian capital, growing, you know, small provincial bourgeoisie against Istanbul and Ankara-based bourgeoisie. And when they came to power, they managed to present a kind of image of unity. People, urban poor, middle classes, growing, you know, like the large classes, they have a shared vision, grow. And it lasted for some time, up until the end of actually, uh, the first decade of the 21st century, growth rate were higher. Uh, they developed also a kind of a neo-paternalistic, redistributive, welfare policies. So people saw that the poverty line is going down, and their poverty rate is going down. That it, and it all happened with amicable relations with the U.S. You know, it all went with amicable relations with the powers in the Gulf at that time. But then, you know, like what we have seen. Um, uh, particularly after the Gezi uprising, which took place in 2013 against the neoliberal policies of the AKP government and the subsequent uh, scandals of, of corruption, uh, the government became more authoritarian. 
and the civil war in Syria, when the Kurdish people, you know, created a political autonomous uh, governance in northern Syria, which is a region called as Rojava, you know, Turkey's state actually left left aside their own democratic, uh, developmentalist, like growth redistributive agenda and resorted to further violence. Now, what we see is Turkey has troops in northern Syria. The whole kind of Kurdish autonomy is there crushed. United States kind of uh, historically, uh, logistically kind of allied with the Kurdish forces for some time and abandoned, and they kind of struck a deal with Turkey. Turkey oscillating between US and Russia, buying air strike missiles from Russia, but at the same time still trying to be in NATO, you know, like with the US, is trying to navigate. So this is, I think, how some imperial forces, you know, like, uh, use political power. Immediately they translate their own interest uh, into the interest of the state. So survival of the Turkish state means at the same time survival.